Good evening, everyone. It's Mike Krupa again. We are broadcasting from Poland. Welcome once again on Voting TV on our Heretics edition. And today we have a special guest, Mr. Larry C. Johnson, hailing all the way from the great state of Florida. Larry, how are you doing this evening or afternoon, depending on what yeah. time zone you're in? Afternoon here. I'm great, Mike. Thanks. Perfect. How was the turkey yesterday? Uh, wonderful. Deep fried on the beach. The only way to do Thanksgiving. Perfect. Real American dream. All right. Before we start, I'd like to encourage everyone to give us a subscribe, a like, uh, as we are just at the beginning journey of our uh, channel. Last week, you may recall, we interviewed Colonel Douglas McGregor, another heretic beloved by the establishment. And today, as I said, we have the honor to have with us Larry C. Johnson. So, Larry, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, my first question is, who is winning the war in Ukraine and why? What is your assessment? Russia's winning, uh, and it's, uh, I think, hands down. It's just not winning it in the conventional way that uh, a lot of pundits expect. And, and as, as we've seen in history, where you've got armies clashing openly in large formations, and bodies getting piled up. Uh, what's really remarkable about what's going on, and let, and let me stipulate why I think Russia is winning. Um, number one, the uh, losses that the Ukrainians are suffering are irreplaceable. Uh, so they're not able, they don't have an ample supply of young men that they can throw into uh, the fray. They're having to draw up on middle-aged men, some old uh, in order to uh, try to replace their losses. The economy is at a standstill. And now Russia has launched what I would call the equivalent of an, uh, the electromagnetic pulse bomb, except the electromagnetic pulse is a form of a nuclear weapon that knocks out all electrical systems. Russia is doing it in a conventional way, whereby destroying critical electrical nodes throughout the country. Ukraine's ability to keep the lights on, keep the water flowing, uh, uh, impossible. And with each passing day, the capability of Ukraine erodes further. Ukraine's industrial base has been hollowed out. They, they, do, not they do not have the capability have not shown the ability to continue to produce weapons uh, during the war. Uh, by contrast, Russia 
is ramping up uh, its production of a variety of weapon systems. So the tax base of Ukraine has uh, disappeared, and and they are they're really in the position of uh, like a crack addict or a meth addict uh, dependent upon their pusher. In this case, the United States and Western Europe represents the pusher. They are providing the finances, the money that's keeping Ukraine afloat on a day to day basis. So the, it, Ukraine has not actually occupied and forced the Russians out of any territory, Western propaganda notwithstanding. The, the, Russia has made what are called tactical withdrawals from certain territory. Again, this has enraged some on the Russian side. Uh, concerned that they think Russia should stand there and fight. But I have to give uh, the Russian generals credit that they're not, they, they're not letting their pride get in the way. They're not saying, we're going to stand and fight and defend a piece of meaningless territory just so we can say that we defended that territory. They're thinking about this very strategically. Uh, the withdrawal from Kherson, for example. Ukraine... Yes, they went and initially occupied it. Well, now they're abandoning the city because they do not have the wherewithal to sustain life in that city. And that, that's really the ultimate measure of when we're looking at who's winning, who's losing. Ukraine is out begging for more weapons, more ammunition, more air defense systems. They don't have a functional air defense system. And the reality is nobody in the West, the United States or NATO, has an effective air defense system. When you put all that together, yeah, Russia's winning. Do you think, this is just a side question that comes from the first one, that one of the mistakes that Putin made, possibly, um, we obviously don't have a way to see into the thoughts of the Russian general staff, is that by giving command to Sirovikin uh, in the East, he actually uh, gave him full command in the sense that uh, politicians will no longer be able to intervene uh, in the operational day-to-day -day minutia that Surovikin is undertaking in the sense that it'll be up to Surovikin what will happen in the East and not to the politicians, not even to uh, Putin on some operational level. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I don't think that's that's correct. I don't think Surovikin is uh, a, lone, a lone wolf operating on his own. Uh, without any regard to the politics uh, of the moment. I mean, even throughout Russian Soviet history, uh, Stalin worked with the Stavka and met with the generals. Uh, but the interesting thing was even Stalin, despite you know his reputation as being a monster, he didn't he didn't do what Hitler did. Hitler was completely uh, uh, unqualified to lead a military. Yet Hitler was making military decisions. Stalin would argue it out with the generals, but he would ultimately listen to reason and accede to the request of the generals. And I, and I think Putin, frankly, is following much that same line. Putin's not going to uh, let Surovikin just go do what Surovikin wants to do, but there's going to be a discussion. And so with uh, across the board with Gorasimov and Shoigu and Surovikin, it's not just a one-man show. The thing, the thing that was put in place with Sarovikin's arrival is what's called a unified command structure, structure with respect to the war. Prior to that, it's uh, the generals in separate areas. You know, generals in the Donbass were operating independent of the generals in Luhansk, independent of the generals in Kherson. Uh, that's gone now. You now have an integrated approach. It's, a, it's akin to what happened when the Allies uh, in World War II named Dwight David Eisenhower as the supreme commander to coordinate and bring all the others together under what singing from one sheet of music. Right. Well, it seems to be making sense thus far. Um, so sticking to the topic of Russia and Ukraine, uh, you've probably heard about that stray missile, that Ukrainian stray missile that landed into Poland. Uh, right. You uh, opined on your blog that this, from your vantage point, looked like a provocation. From what we know now, uh, and 
the news of the last two or three days apparently has been that the Polish prosecutors have actually denied access to Ukrainians to take part in the investigation. So it seems that impartiality is still not dead, which is a good thing, considering the uh, orientation of the uh, uh, the politicians in Warsaw. Uh, as we sit here today, uh, what do you think uh, happened uh, that fateful day two, day two weeks ago where those two poor Polish farmers, unfortunately, were killed by that S-300? Yeah, I... With the the G20 meeting was underway, uh, the Hague was bringing down a verdict against uh, condemning Russians for the downing of the seventeen aircraft. Uh, and uh, so I think Zelensky, in consultation with the Poles, chose that as the moment to uh, provoke an incident because the claim that this was a uh, just a, an errant missile, a defense missile fired at incoming uh, missiles from Russia is just, I don't think it's credible for, for the following reasons. What direction are the Russians firing missiles from? They're firing them from east. They travel west, okay? And then, or they're firing it from the south, the Black Sea, south to north. Well, Poland is on the, the western edge of Ukraine, Lviv about 70 miles, 80 miles away inland. And so if, if you put rockets, your air defense system that's around Lviv to prevent and shoot down incoming missiles, how in the world the missile is coming this direction that you fire like this and then the missile turns around and goes the opposite direction? Doesn't happen that way. Uh, that's not that's not a miss. This was a deliberate provocation, I believe. I understand that there's a fertilizer plant nearby that had those missiles landed in the fertilizer plant. There would not have been the clear evidence that the forensic signature of the missile was in fact part of an S-300 unit. Uh, so when you, when you look at all of that, it's absolutely a provocation that went awry. Uh, Zelensky was hoping to get NATO to invoke Article 5 because he realized they're losing. If, if the Ukrainians were actually winning, if they were actually confident that they had the Russians on the ropes, you wouldn't see this kind of behavior, kind of extreme rhetoric on the part of Zelensky. Do you think, uh, because I heard Scott Ritter, whom you know, uh, contend that this might have been an action on the part of some faction in the Ukrainian military, not necessarily with the knowledge of Zelensky. What do you what do you think of that? Uh, I discount that for the following reason. Zelensky was out very quickly, shortly after the missile landed, encouraging that to take action. Uh, the reaction of somebody who's in the dude, what the heck is that? What is that? Um, it, it seems that uh, it was, I, I would disagree, with that, but, you know, we'll find out. Hopefully, hopefully we're counting on that impartiality of those uh, good prosecutors. Um, we heard lately that there's been some back channel diplomacy. A lot of people are interpreting those meetings between Burns and his Russian counterpart and Sullivan in Turkey, I believe, as some sort of, uh, you know, the beginning is a prologue to some sort of deal at the end of the day. Uh, you work the intelligence side of things for a long time. How do you assess these meetings between the American intel community at the highest echelons and the Russians that have taken place in the last couple of weeks and months behind the scenes, obviously? Well, there, there have been continuing contacts between Russian intelligence and U.S. intelligence over the, over the years. So that, that this is let's go turning more to the status quo uh, a variety of rooms to gather and share information. But this is, Russia has zero interest in negotiating a settlement. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be on Russian terms. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not about, uh, the, the Russia not in the corner, the United States is. It is the United States and the future of NATO that are at stake on one hand, or, survival of Russia as a nation on the other. Uh, the Russians historically are not uh, easy 
uh, marks to give up a fight for their nation's at stake. Um, so I, I think the, the, that what, what Burns is doing may have something to do with trying to negotiate a prisoner exchange and get uh, the, the basketball player Griner out in exchange for Victor Booth uh, coming out of the United States. But uh, I don't see the Russians really in any hurry right now to, to negotiate a deal. It would seem so. Um, turning to the European theater of things, uh, you've obviously heard that the uh, Europeans, along with the Americans, are considering that price cap on Russian oil. Uh, the Polish proposition is 30 a barrel, which nobody even in Western Europe is taking seriously. Now, the contention is that once we put that price cap on Russian oil, that's when we'll actually see the real damage on the Russian economy. Uh, what do you think of such uh, bold predictions? Somebody's using hallucinogenic drugs that's uh, adopting that position. I mean, come on. Or, you know, they've been they've been drinking too much Jabrufka, huh? You know, this is... <laughs> please. Yeah. Try, try go to the store. Walk into any merchant and pick up an item and say the item is priced at, uh, you know, $20. And you say, hey, I'm price capping. I'm going to only give you $5 for it. Well, depending upon the store, the location, and the local gun laws, the odds are if you take it at that price, you get shot, that or arrested for shoplifting. So, I, you know, how do they enforce it? Do they say, we're only going to pay you $30? And Russia says, okay, fine. You don't get the oil. We've got other, we got other people who pay. Uh, I, I, I frankly don't understand this entire concept of trying to impose unilaterally a price cap. Because the, it, you, you could impose a price cap if you control the supply. They don't con the West doesn't control the supply. Russia controls the supply. So this is, this is just one more stupid step by the part of NATO, uh, Europe, and the United States uh, in trying to use economic damage as a way to create regime change in Russia. Ain't going to happen. This will... History will look back, and this will be one of the great historical uh, glitches, errors ever made uh, to have calculated that Russia could be easily taken down economically. And what turns out is the West itself has sort of co committed economic suicide. Right. It, it does seem that every time uh, you hear we're going to put new sanctions on Russia, more and more people in Europe, especially even in Eastern Europe, or especially in Eastern Europe, we're interpreting it as simply, okay, you're slapping more sanctions on the average Joe in Europe, not, not, on, not on the Russians. Yeah. So just, you know, substitute the word Russians for, you know, the typical Joe Blow in Europe, and that's what you get at the end of the day. So we're definitely feeling it uh, on our end. Um, as a matter of fact, I heard some voices from Russia today that, you know, you guys in the West have Black Friday, you know, once a year. Well, in Russia, because we're not experiencing the economic woes as you guys, we have Black Friday every Friday, every day, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that, that's a that's a pretty good uh, conclusion to what is actually happening. Um, sticking to Russia, uh, you worked the terrorist angle in the State Department for some time, right? And the European Parliament, in its uh, profound genius, uh, labeled Russian Federation as a terrorist state in the last few days. Uh, what do you think of what the European Parliament has done in this regard? It's it's a meaningless gesture. All, all it's going to do is further uh, div uh, separate any possibility of R Russia reconciling with Europe in the near term. It's, it's name calling. Oh, you're a terrorist state. And, and with that, there may come some additional sanctions. But Russia has already established it does not need the West. I think I think that is really one of the sort of profound discoveries that has taken place over the months. Uh, previously, there was there there was an element within Russian culture, uh, this sort of sense of inferiority that we needed to uh, be you know show the West that we can be as good as the West. Uh, I, I had oh geez, this is back in 1981. I took a group of students. I was teaching at the American University at the time. Uh, I took a group of students to the then Soviet embassy and met with the, the, um, the deputy chief of mission, I believe. 
And during the course of the, the discussion, it came up something about the missiles that the United States had. And the, 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 the Soviet diplomat at the time said, well, we've got that too. Yes, we, you know, it was very defensive. And it was a, it's, it's the kind of reaction you get from somebody with an inferiority complex. I think what Russia has now discovered over the past eight months is not only are they as competent as we are, they're more competent. They always made an assumption that perhaps the West was better than it is, that the West had gr greater wealth, that the gr West had greater intelligence. The, the, and fa the fact of the matter is the average Russian child at any age better educated than any American child even those from the wealthiest families that go to the best schools. The Russian education system is far superior to what the United States has. You know, the fact that the United States has been dependent on Russia, going back, I think, to 2004, to have, this, to have their rockets take our astronauts to the space station. Without Russian rockets, the United States would be grounded. And the, the fact that the Russian economy is self-sufficient. So when and, and and to a way to a degree that the United States is not. The United States has the potential to be a self-sufficient economy, but but the reality is the rare earth minerals that are essential for some of the modern uh, computer systems and other modern technology, those only to be found in places like Afghanistan, China, or Russia. So Russia is at a at a place where it can produce its own. Um, look at the fact that the United States is having to go begging South Korea for, uh, you know, 100,000 rounds of ammunition or artillery shells. Well, it used to be in World War II, the United States could produce all of that in a week. They, they can't even now produce it in a year. So it's just uh, I, out of this now, I think Russia has come to discover, wait a second, we're not some podunk backwater gas station for the West. We're, we're an independent nation with a rich cultural history, and we're going to stand on our own two feet. And we do not, ne we do not need these people anymore. We're not going to be coerced. We're not going to be bullied. We're not going to be threatened. So from the vantage point of the United States, I guess in the collective West, but the United States in particular, if, if we could boil down the last, I don't know, 20 years, to a single sentence of when it comes to intent towards Russia, and many smart people have made this uh, uh, have made this point, but I think it's important that you uh, you make this point also, as we have a large Polish audience listening to us. The ideal would be to have another Boris Yeltsin in the Kremlin. Would you agree? Oh yeah, we want we want someone we can manipulate. The, the bottom line is the way the West wants to rate Russia economically. Period. They they don't give a damn about the Russian people. They want to extract as much of the resources and wealth as can be extracted. And, you know, that's sort of what I, I think that's one of the underlying reasons for the anger in the West, the, the vitriol uh, towards Putin. You know, the only thing we've seen close to the irrational uh, anger at directed to Putin is the the Trump derangement syndrome here in the United States. So there's the, the idiotic claims about uh, Trump in an attempt to attack and destroy him. And, and one of the reasons they're going after Putin is because Putin put a stop to the looting that went on during the 1990s. And he, he came into office and ground that to a halt. And in the process then turned around and has recreated Russian society. They're the, 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 there's, photogra there's photographs and videos out there that can show the, the dramatic transformation that's taken place across Russia in terms of modern infrastructure, modern build, improved quality of life. Things that, compared to the United States, the United States has gone backwards over that same period. Our cities haven't gotten better or cleaner or more pristine. It's been the opposite in Russia. Uh, so... Uh, the, the anger is directed at Putin because he actually delivered on the promise to not loot the country for himself, but to reinvest those dollars in Russian infrastructure and in defense systems that actually work for Russia. 
you know, it, this is not like, you know, the United States West literally almost a trillion dollars fighting useless, needless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and invested none of that money in the local uh, infrastructure here in the United States. <clears throat> it, it was sharp contrast to what took place in, in Russia. Uh, but it's almost like it's the jealousy of the West. That's where the anger comes from. Yeah, well, one has to ask with this canceling, you know, uh, Russian opera writers have to do with, you know, sanctions on Russia or, <laughs> or banning Russian vodka, for example, which we've seen uh, this uh, festival of hatred and Orwellian terms going on for the last couple of months. Everybody's seen it. So I, I would agree that, yeah, this definitely looks like uh, a form of jealousy coming out. Uh, coming back to the question of Europe vis-a-vis -vis Russia, because uh, in the last few hours, we got information. There was a response from the Germans uh, to the Polish Minister of Defense's request to provide Poland with extra Patriot batteries that were to be stationed on the eastern border uh, of Poland on the, uh, the, the Ukrainian segment. Now, the Polish interpretation would be that uh, those Patriot missiles would not only protect Poland, uh, but also parts of the territory of Ukraine, which obviously is a red light. Now, the Germans came back to us and said, we'll give you the Patriot missiles, but we'll give them to you, not to Ukraine, uh, because you're a NATO country and Ukraine isn't a NATO country. And it seems that ever since that rocket hit Poland, there are certain elements within the Eastern European political establishment, in the Baltic states, that are trying in any way possible to give some sort of uh, air coverage or a possible mini no-fly zone to Ukraine. Uh, are you seeing the same thing from your vantage point, that there's this there's this push to get us in there any way possible? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a sign of desperation. I, I think it the, the main source of it is in Poland. Um, I, and I think at the same time, what you're starting to see is a fracturing of the consensus in Europe that previously existed. Previously saying, okay, yeah, we'll support, uh, we'll, we're all in it for Ukraine. Eh, they're starting to have second thoughts, uh, Hungary in particular. Uh, I think you're going to see growing concerns in Germany, in France, in the UK from the domestic political pressure. While the politicians there continue to insist on backing Ukraine at any cost, uh, the, the populace is, I think, tiring of that when they are facing inflation and rising unemployment. So uh, it, is, it is quite curious that they, um, they feel the need to deploy these, what, these let's call them anti-air defense systems that don't work. The Patriot missile system is a boondoggle in my view. Uh, if it was effective, then the Yemen, Yemeni, I get the Houthi rebels would not have been able to fire uh, missiles into Saudi Arabia that hit uh, key oil facilities. Despite having Patriot batteries, they couldn't shoot them down. Now, they're, what they're going up against is a Russian technology with hypersonic missiles that the West has n has nothing in its arsenal to, to protect against that. Nothing. So, uh, whereas the Russians, by contrast, absolutely have air defense systems capable of shooting down hypersonic missiles. Uh, if, if the United States and, or anyone in NATO is foolish enough to try to impose a no-fly zone, all they're going to ensure is they're going to have a lot of downed NATO pilots. Right. Well, the, the, the push is certainly there, and it seems that the Germans, despite uh, their foreign minister saying a few months back, well, I don't really care what the German electorate thinks, we're going to support Ukraine seems behind the scenes that they're more rational than they make out to be in public, at least. So uh, in this regard, and you mentioned Zhubrovka, so I want you to sort of transform yeah. yourself right now into a, <laughs> into a hired gun from the states that would advise the Polish government, because our government likes to listen to Washington. As a matter of fact, it seems at most uh, occasions that they like to take instructions from Washington, and they feel that that is the epitome of Polish independence where Washington tells you what to do, and that makes you feel so good because that only confirms that we're really independent because we're no longer subservient to Moscow, we're subservient to Washington right now. So I'm going to ask you, as an American, uh, a former CIA analyst and somebody who worked at the State Department, 
What would you advise the Polish government today if you were asked for such advice? I would ask the Poles to figure out what is their objective. You know, I've, I've had the privilege, I've been in, in, the, in Krakow and traveled a little bit around Poland. Uh, great, you know, beautiful city, wonderful food, great people. I, I'm really scratching my head trying to figure out Poland needs to disentangle itself from the past. On the one hand, it remains furious uh, with the Russians for the Katyn massacre. So a massacre of over 80 years ago. I, I get it. Um, there, the, the, that's sort of one of the faults or flaws of Europe is they, they don't forget. So these, these injuries, these wounds remain fresh, even though they're 80 years old. Um, then at the same time, because it, the, this lingering trauma from World War II, if we're given what Poland suffered, uh, is you got the anger at the Russians and the anger still at the Germans. So at the same time that the Poles want some support from Germany, they're turning around telling the Germans, oh, by the way, you owe us $1.2 trillion in war reparations. And the Germans are going, what? <laughs> you know, so I, I think Poland needs to figure out what, what is it really trying to accomplish? If it's trying to settle scores from World War II, that's a loser. They're not, they're not going to win that. All it's going to do is create more pain and suffering. Um, I, I, to me, it would seem it's in Poland's interest, number one, to limit the flow of refugees coming from Ukraine into Poland. That's number one. Uh, number two, to promote economic relationships, not just with Ukraine, but with Russia, because the, having positive economic relationships with both of those countries will ultimately enrich the Polish people. I don't, I, again, the going trying to provoke a war with especially Russia is insanity. Uh, and the notion that if, if Poland has not learned any lesson from uh, the World War II, remember they were promised by the United Kingdom. Oh, you know, if you're invaded, boy, we got your back. Well, how'd that work out? It didn't. I mean, you know, the UK, because the UK couldn't do anything. Well, the United States is in the same position. Yeah, we can promise, oh, we're going to come fight on your behalf. But with what? How? We don't have a magical transporter that can move troops and vehicles and tanks over the ocean immediately into Poland so that they could be there. It's just, you know, that magic doesn't exist. So Poland, if it got into an actual shooting war with someone who, say, Russia, is going to find itself largely on its own and not in a position to be able to withstand uh, the Russian military because the Russians have a tremendous technological edge over the West, over NATO, over the United States. And it's important that people wake up to that. I think... Uh... One of the things that we have to point out, just sticking on this military angle here, is the question of escalation dominance. And I know a lot of people have been talking about that recently. There are a lot of uh, you know, good-hearted Polish patriots, people who not necessarily love Russia, but believe at least in terms of escalation dominance, the situation is on an equal footing in Eastern Europe, that whatever the Russians do, NATO can counter uh, on an equal footing. Uh, what do you have to say to such a contention? Uh, how many countries in Europe and part of NATO can build their own rocket ships and fly to outer space? France, the, you can launch an occasional one. The answer is the rest of them, none. So when you look factor in the possibility of space warfare, the ability to shoot missiles from the ground into space, taking out critical satellites, Who's got the advantage there? Russia. They have a clear advantage on that side. They've actually, they've wargamed it and they've designed weapons for that purpose. Not. Right now, we're in a position where Western societies are more dependent than ever on technology and satellite communication. You know, the, when, when, you were, when you were growing up, you didn't see people walking around doing this with their phone. Now you do, because people are constantly connected to their phone to say, you know, 
is to stay in touch. Well, when when that satellite network is wiped out and all of a sudden you're blind and there's no communication, uh, we're back we're back into 19th century communication styles. So that, that's why I said this escalatory dominance. Well, the other the other factor is Russia actually has the ability to withstand, I believe, withstand a nuclear first strike because they have developed defense systems that can shoot down U.S. intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine launched ballistic missiles, or air launched cruise missiles, all of it. Uh, why is that? Because in 2000, 2001, George W. Bush thought it was really a good idea to abandon the anti-ballistic missile defense treaty. And Russia tried to talk him out of him at the time. The United States was adamant. And then the United States gets embroiled in the so-called war on terror. Uh, the the research priority for defense, missile defense systems falls to the wayside. And Russia not only escalates, but achieves great technological strides in building missile defense systems. So I'm saying that uh, I, I really believe in, in a military calculation. Russia would have a good chance of shooting down uh, most, if not all, U.S. missiles that would be launched at it with nuclear weapons, if it came to that. And God pray to God that it never does. But again, when you're talking about escalation and weighing what resources do you have on your side, that's something that Russia has that the West doesn't. Right. And I hope uh, that advice will be heard somewhere in Warsaw, this unofficial advice. Free for now from Larry C. Johnson, but yeah. who knows? <laughs> Maybe for a bottle of uh, Zhubrovka. Um, uh, turning stateside, uh, Larry, uh, as we know, the Republicans have taken the House, uh, uh, which many people have viewed with much uh, happiness and anticipation. Uh, what do you think will change in terms of policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? We know that Biden wants to shove more money in the lame duck session to Ukraine. Do you think that will uh, he'll be successful? And what do you think will happen after uh, January? How will the Republicans in Congress respond to, uh, to the Ukraine conundrum? Yeah, I, I think he will get the, the aid package shoved through before the end of the year. Uh, but once the new Congress is in, uh, the, the determining factor will be the U.S. economy. And all, all signs over here, it's, it's flashing red. The, the, the outlook is not good. And uh, I think it, once we're past Christmas and into the new year, the reality of the worsening economy is going to, to grow. And in, in, in the wake of that, faced with that kind of problem, the Republican Congress is not going to be in the mood to go showering more uh, aid uh, to Ukraine, military or economic for that matter. They'll want to use it at home. There'll be a great pressure to do that. So I, uh, I, uh, the, the other thing that's going to factor in here is what happens on the ground in Ukraine. And as we talked earlier on with the turning all the lights off, Ukraine's ability to sustain military operations is going to be severely tested. And I, I think the Russians, as they continue to roll up and push the Ukrainians back and take control of more and more territory, the, the appetite for continuing to throw money into the black hole of Ukraine is going to uh, dry up. Well, hopefully Warsaw will follow suit because we're priding ourselves that not only have we taken a few million Ukrainians into Poland, uh, we're basically building a parallel society and many people have actually signed on to the uh, hashtag spearheaded by our probably most courageous member of parliament, Grzegorz Brown, the, the, uh, the activity is called, or the action is called Stop Ukrainization of Poland. So we're hoping that'll gain uh, momentum in the next few, uh, few weeks, few months. Um, but sticking to the, uh, sticking stateside, so to say, you're in the state uh, which has a great governor, Ron DeSantis, and we know that there has been some back and forth between former President Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. I know you've written a blog post where you chastised the Donald for coming so hard after Ron DeSantis. Uh, how do you think how, how do you think things will play out in the next few months in terms of the uh, Republican nomination? Are we going to see a cage match between these two giants, or will one of them say, "Okay, you're the boss. I'll, I'll back down." 
Uh, it's, it's really up to DeSantis because DeSantis is getting lots of encouragement to take on Trump in the cage. The problem is there is the, the, the Republican Party is very deeply divided. And uh, you've got sort of the traditional wing of the, the, the well, let's call them the wealthy country club Republicans who would like everything to be like it was 20 years ago, the Jeb Bush folks. And they find Donald Trump just abhorrent. They can't stand him. He's an awful, awful man in their view. And they dismiss Trump without recognizing there's not a single Republican candidate out there, including Ron DeSantis, that can go out and hold a rally and is going to have people willing to stand in line overnight to see him. And that, that power of personality, that charisma is something that Trump has. As, as you know, as I wrote and you uh, referenced, it, Trump is his own worst enemy. Uh, some of the things he says and does works against him. His personnel selections and his first administration are a part of the reason he's in trouble. He selected Christopher Wray to run the FBI and uh, Bill Barr at the Department of Justice. And before that, Jeff Sessions. And, you know, you go down the list, he just he, he had a, just a horrible track record of selecting people when he played this character on television that knew how to hire and fire people. Well, in real life, he didn't. And, you know, he's got to overcome that. But that said, he is in touch with a popul population, a popular majority, I would argue, in the United States who are sick and tired of the United States meddling in foreign wars, sending their children, their sons, mostly their sons, some daughters, into these foreign conflicts where they're the ones killed, wounded, and damaged, sent back while the children of these, you know, elites go off and make deals in Ukraine like Hunter Biden with Burisma. So uh, Trump has tapped into that. He's tapped into the need that the, the elites have been willing to sacrifice local people for uh, international trade. And in the course, just completely dismantled communities. There used to be communities that were built around local factories that once those were sent to Mexico or some other foreign country, those communities then literally die. They wither on the vine. So, you know, at this point, I think Trump, Trump is still in a very powerful position because he has more support, more popular support uh, than even DeSantis. Uh, but, you know, it will be if DeSantis and Trump get into uh, a battle over it, it'll end up destroying the Republican Party because the Trump supporters will not support the establishment. We saw that in Colorado with this uh, one Senate Republican candidate, Joe O'Day was his name. And uh, he was one of the most vocal in being, I'm not going to follow Donald Trump and I wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. And he, he was the ultimate anti-Trump Republican. He lost by 20 points. The, uh, all the Trump critics keep saying, oh, Donald lost this last election. Yet his candidates, by and large, they were always in the race to the end. And in many cases, you had situations where the establishment Republicans like McConnell pulled support, refused to fund certain candidates like Blake Masters and Senate candidate in Arizona. So, um, you know, this is it's not going to be a smooth road. It's going to be a very bumpy, chaotic road. And, and, and again, in the in the midst of that, I think the foreign policy concerns like Ukraine, they're going to fade into the into the mess. Nobody will care. We'll be too worried about what's going on in the United States. And rightly so. Um, my last question uh, for tonight. Uh, I know you were personally involved because you mentioned Hunter Biden. So I have to ask this uh, sure, sure. with the uh, laptop uh, issue. Uh, sure. You wrote a blog post about that. I was wondering if you could just uh, introduce our audience to your role and maybe to some background history about what took place uh, with uh, Hunter and his famous laptop. Sure. Well, I have a I have an old friend. The reason I moved to Florida, his name is Bob Dido, Polish gentleman. So still proud of his Polish heritage. And uh, Bob was a pilot in Vietnam, later became a B-52 pilot. While flying in Vietnam, Bob had a co-pilot by the name of Steve McIsaac, Mac. 
So I met Mac, you know, about 20 years ago. We played golf. And then, uh, uh, you know, we'd stay in touch uh, intermittently through Bob. And when uh, on October 15th of uh, 2020, uh, we get this frantic phone call from Mac. He said, hey, can you help my son? Said, Who's your son? Uh, jo John Paul. So I suddenly realized his son was the computer repairman that had uh, Hunter Biden's laptop. And so I spent a couple hours on the phone that night uh, with John Paul, helping get it, getting his security situation straightened out, getting him uh, legal assistance and help him walking through what he needed to do in order to protect himself. And so it, and then put him in contact. I have a, another uh, computer forensic guy that's uh, top notch, got him in touch with uh, my friend Yakov and Yakov went down and made a, a, an image of the drive, got, got everything uh, copied and secured in a way so that they had a chain of custody. And then, uh, uh, then the attack started and we had him hunkered down for that. So um, the, the material on that laptop was just disgusting and revealing at the same time about the level of corruption on the part of the Biden family. And that's why they were desperate to dismiss it as Russian propaganda or a Russian disinformation operation. It was anything but. It was real. What, what this whole episode also shows is the FBI in the United States is as corrupt as anything that existed in the former Soviet empire uh, with, uh, or in Nazi Germany's Gestapo. It's, it's that bad. It's so politicized and it's acting as an arm of the Democrat party to the detriment of the rights of uh, con constitutional rights of American citizens. So just to follow up on this, do you believe, as many Republicans and Americans uh, are, uh, are stating right now, that the FBI basically needs to go, or maybe the FBI and the CIA, or some other uh, intelligence uh, institution? Both, both, yeah, both need to be dismantled, taken to the ground, start over. Uh, FBI is, you know, it, it, it's just got to be, it has to be dismantled. The corruption is endemic to the upper level. And uh, that's why you've had, I think, over 20 FBI agents come out as whistleblowers. Uh, CIA is in a similar uh, real, it, it's, a, it's a real dilemma. The problems there are deep. Uh, part of the problem is they've really eliminated the wall that once separated the analytical side from the operation side. So now you've got the analytical side really subordinate to operations. And when that happens, you can never get a good objective analysis because the pressure is great for the analysts to be, quote, team players, support the ongoing operation, and not saying anything that would be disparaging or discouraging. So basically, as JFK said, it needs to be smashed into a thousand pieces. Yes. In essence. He was right. He was right. Right. It's interesting that after, I think it was two weeks after his assassination, uh, Harry Truman wrote an op-ed where, uh, if you were reading between the lines, he basically said, oh, the CIA needs to get back to its analytical functions, which was pretty telling at the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In fact, uh, I went I went to middle school across the street from Harry Truman's house. So I, I have living memory of seeing Truman walk the streets of independence. Well. I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> that young. That young. Yeah. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that was Larry C. Johnson talking with us tonight. Uh, Larry, thank you once again for your time. We'll hope to do this again in the future sometime. Maybe then we can open a bottle of Zhubrovka. Uh, it's legal, virtually speaking, so I don't think there will be a problem. And I know that you have some fairly good liberal, positively liberal laws in that regard in, uh, in Florida, at least yes. when it comes to uh, virtual drinking. So we'll hope to do this again soon. Uh, keep on doing what you're doing, the truth and information that you're putting out is very important also to the reading people here in Poland, and I'm one of them, and we very much appreciate your time, your insight, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you once again, Larry, and have a good evening. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Take care.